I think we can just get started on time. You can hear me fine like this, I guess. Yeah, wonderful. Um, this is a talk about our gateway, the gateway we built for Gardena during the last two years. And we saw in the, uh, in the call for papers that there was a topic, war stories, and we thought, yes, this fits perfectly because this, from our perspective, this is pretty much our war story. And I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions, feel free to ask during the talk, or I'm pretty sure we'll have time after the talk. I'm Andreas Müller. This is Reta Schneider. And my slides don't work. So I'll give you a brief introduction about the company, about us, about why we built the gateway. Uh, then we'll show you some of the technical background, not because we think you can learn a lot from us there. We are pretty much beginners with the Octo, but because it's important to understand the rest of the talk. Then we go into what we did with open source, how we open sourced our stuff, um, how we also plan to keep our products open for our customers and what we achieved by mainlining things. That was a pretty much a big gain for us, that we mainlined things. So starting right with the introduction, um, Rito Schneider and myself, we both work at Gardena in Zurich. We both have been doing embedded development for quite a while, but more with microcontrollers, not so much with embedded Linux. And both of us had very little experience with embedded Linux and no experience with the Octo. So that was pretty new for us. Um, I chose this picture to tell you about our company, uh, Gardena. Gardena is a pretty traditional company. We manufacture gardening products. And gardening products like um, rakes, like watering products, um, Gardena has pretty much no experience with, with electronics, very little experience with electronics, and until I think five years ago, no experience with software development. So you can imagine, usually at Gardena, when a project is done, it's done, and we, don't, we no longer worry about it. Uh, this is kind of uh, quite a stark contrast to something like a gateway, where you, you finish it, and then maybe you maintain it for 10 to 20 years. That's, that's quite a new ma mindset for Gardena. Uh, but now the new uh, Gardena product line that we're partly responsible for is the Gardena Smart System. And I chose this picture to represent it to show you on one side. So we have all these products in the garden, like a mower, like watering products, like a pump. And we have the smartphone app to control these. We have the servers for things like weather forecasts. And in the center of it all is the gateway. And the gateway isn't something we really want to sell to our customers, but we just have to because we need to communicate with the devices. And there's no standard sub-gigahertz IoT technology yet where you can just buy a gateway and, and communicate via that. Or if you know which one, I mean, there are many technologies. There is Zigbee, there is Bluetooth, there is LoRa. But none of these has succeeded uh, enough to know, okay, we can use that and just no longer worry about the gateway. Or if you think you know which technology is going to win, please talk to us afterwards because we would be very interested. Maybe a bit of background about the project. Uh, the main goal was to lower the hardware costs. Um, we had to have maintainability for at least 10 years, so we want to, to sell the gateway for maybe five years and after that, we should maintain it. We usually calculate with eight years at least uh, internally. And we wanted to have open source compliance. Uh, Reto is going to tell you more about that in a second. Challenges was that we have quite a distributed team. We have part of the team, a large part in Switzerland, in Zurich, part in Germany, in Ulm, part in Sweden, because Husqvarna is Swedish, and part in Denmark. We had no backup plan. We, we needed to have this project uh, successful. Otherwise, I think we would have been in quite a bit of trouble. And we had a, a very short timeline, one year from a project start to sale. Yeah? Oh, yeah. And uh, important to know is we already had one gateway out, and that was the first generation. But we wanted to make uh, the second generation more technically sound and cheaper. And what we want to achieve with this, this talk is we want to show you how our gateway works a bit on the technical side. 
we want to um, tell you about our open source journey, uh, how we, we went from being a company that had pretty much no idea what the GPL is or what open source means to the state where we are now. Uh, we want to tell you how we benefited from mainlining our stuff, and hopefully you can show this talk to your boss if you want to mainline stuff as well, because um, from a risk perspective, it, it was very useful. And if we have time, we also have some, some slides about the pitfalls we had and uh, how you can tinker with our gateway. But if you don't have time for that, it's, it's just like for reference on the slides. Yeah, and we, we want to say it's, it's not done, so we, we know that we still have a lot to open, a lot to do. We're not perfect, the system is not perfect, but we're on our way. That's, that's basically what we're thinking. And neither of us are Yocto experts. So if, if you think we could do something better, talk to us. The code is now also on GitHub, so you can send pull requests. Yeah, let's get right into the technical background. Um, for the hardware, we have uh, a MediaTek MT7688, and in the future I'm just going to say the MediaTek chipset because it's always so complicated to pronounce. Um, we have 128 megabytes of RAM, 128 megabytes of NAND flash, and 8 megabytes of NOR flash. And we have a radio module that's for communicating with the devices via sub gigahertz. We need sub gigahertz because we need quite a bit of range because our products are in the garden. And uh, the gateway is usually inside the house, so we have to communicate through the house into the garden. Maybe even a garden could be on the back side of the house. Maybe there's a tree in between. So we need quite a bit of range. On the radio module, we have an, an ARM Cortex M3 and a sub gigahertz transceiver from Scilabs. So it's, it's pretty standard hardware, hardware I think. Um, most of you might know MediaTek. It's, it's very commonly used. This is what our gateway looks like. You have, uh, or actually I'm just going to skip to the next slide because then I annotated what we have where. We have the Linux module, a big part. We have a power supply, the radio module on the right. We have several antennas. You see the PCB antennas. And we have the UART, and uh, the, the main thing you should probably remember from this slide is where the UART is placed, because if you ever want to play with our gateway, this is where you need to solder on a connector. Um, is that already you? Yeah, for the software aspect, this slide is here not because it's extremely interesting, but mainly because of the unused space. So I explain the rest first, and then you maybe you should get the joke later on. The, we have two memories on the or like flash memories on the device. The first one is no, we boot from it using U boot. We have the environments there and the factory calibration data, plus like seven megabytes of unused space. More about that later. And on the spine end flash we have twice like two root FS, two kernels and an overlay where the user data goes into and the update mechanism just toggles between the two kernels and root FS. Then the build system, it's 95% off the shelf, really standard stuff. What we did is was the, having a layer for distribution aspects for some custom packages, another one, then one for the third party, pack, third party packages, one for the PSP for the MediaTek, and another one for the firmwares which are running on our devices in the garden. Now to the more interesting stuff probably, the open source from scratch. Not in the sense that we programmed everything from scratch, but we started really from the back side. Like when our system got released first time in 2016, uh, pretty much immediately a German uh, news site called us out that uh, we are violating the GPL and we are not, uh, they asked for the source code even and there's custom support, like basically nobody at Cardina knew what we had to do and yeah, the, the news site did not get what they wanted for, and it's, that stayed like a year or so. Then when I joined the company, 2000, beginning of 2017, months later, I filed a, an issue. Because of that, I really tried hard to describe all the details, but apparently it was a bit 
too much, too complicated, did not really get uh, prioritized as I wished. But after a while, a year later than like 2018, uh, this McCarty, he went to court and got a in ruling that the company was violating the GPL has to pay either 250,000 euros and or going to jail like the CEO of the company. And this helped me a lot. I could write a really... <laughs> Yeah, the exact details are censored out, but basically it was about CEOs going to jail <laughs> or paying a quarter million. Yeah, and then suddenly got some traction and we were allowed to work on. And basically what happened is like the new project we did, we just did it right from the beginning. Then we went parallel to that to the, our supplier, told them, hey, you should have told us about GPL and so on, and now deliver us the source code so we are able to hand out the source codes if somebody asks. And the uh, new gateway, uh, we put it on GitHub already, like up front. Yeah, so that was more the software side, and ideally we also want to keep the hardware open. And for me, for instance, hardware, having open hardware means if I buy the device as a customer, I should own it and I should have the right to, to log in and to have access to it. And that's, I mean, traditionally for Gardena, if we sell a gardening device, the, the customer owns it, so it should be kind of uh, familiar, but still for the gateway, it was a bit more difficult to convince Gardena that our hardware should be at least as, as open as possible. And originally, this is again the original gateway. We did not allow our customers access to the gateway. We just closed it up, or the company that was uh, actually hired to, to implement it closed it up, and um, we didn't allow any access. But of course, it wasn't done very well, and some customer, we don't know exactly who this is, but this is a description from, from GitHub. Someone found out to root our gateway, and this is actually quite uh, an easy way I know there's another way, but uh, my way would be more complicated, so it seems this, this way is uh, the best one. So it's, it's quite easy, even for our regional gateway, to, to access it and to reverse and engineer things. But of course, from our perspective, as I said, we think you should own it if you buy it. And we also realize locking down hardware like this is, is quite difficult, and, and, and especially if you want to do it right, you have to have hardware support, you have to have like, um, even from, from boot to, to the shell, you have to, to sign everything and to lock down everything. And we don't really want to do that, and it's also not really important because if you own the gateway, say if you have physical access to the gateway, as I mentioned before, the gateway is inside the house. If you have physical in access to the gateway inside the house, you don't have to hack the gateway to turn the water off in the garden. You just can, can just much more easily go into the garden and turn, turn off the water there. So um, really, we thought, why don't we just leave the root access open for the customer, at least via, via UART? And we kind of proposed, or we actually just did that. We, we implemented an open root access on the gateway, and then we got this issue from our quality department. Um, uh, there was some confusion there. Um, I should really stress, we never had the intention of leaving access via SSH open. It's always just been access via UART, and you have to solder on the UART connector to, to have this access. And I think that the main discussions we had with our product quality department was to explain exactly this point, that it's not, it's not about you go via Ethernet and you just log in and somebody else log in. No, it's you, you um, open the screws on the back of the gateway, you solder on the connector, and then you have access. And we, we had this discussion quite a while. Um, we also, they also were worried about um, service department. What if someone accesses the gateway and later the gateway ends up uh, broken and we have to replace it? For that, we kind of discussed, yeah, well, there are those, those uh, stickers you can place on the screws and then you can say, oh, but you opened it. And in the end, we kind of got an agreement and what we did, we just have this ban banner, but now if you buy our gateway, you can just log in via root and there's no password. 
So our customers are free to, to log into their own gateway, which is what we certainly think how it should be. Yeah, so uh, for, uh, quite a, a cool result from, from my perspective. The next point is about mainlining stuff. When we started the project in April 2018, around then we decided to go with the media tech, based mainly because of the financial, like the, the price, which was really attractive. And on the software side, it looked a little bit less attractive. What media tech uh, is offering is a U-boot, which is based on the mainline one from 2005 a kernel 2.6 something, and or the OpenWRT 3.10, which is also like already four or five years old. And upstream-wise, there was not that much support. Uh, U-boot had nothing at all. Linux had some drivers, but not really this SOC. And OpenWRT had support, like without of three patches. So our plan was to hire a U-boot maintainer, like, no, thanks. They implemented support in U-Boot for our SOC, which then allowed us to have like uh, proper scripting capabilities. Plus, this was quite relevant to access the spy end, not just the spy nor, which then allowed us, in theory at least, to put the Linux kernel on the spy end, which is much cheaper, and we could reduce the spy nor and save money. And this is what we uh, pitched to management. We reduced the uh, spy no from eight to one me megabyte. We, for that to work, we implement the uh, spy end support. Uh, luckily, it was already really close to mainline at that point. We just had to write the spy drivers. And yeah, this cost way less than having this uh, price difference times the gateways we intend to sell. In the end, we did not really changed the spinal, but yeah, it convinced management in the first place, so it worked really well from our point of view. And the Linux side, we intended to basically just uh, bring over whatever OpenWRT has and use it on our uh, MediaTek BSP layer. So in November 2018, the state was like that, that we U-Boat support worked really well. Uh, our collaboration with Thanks was really going we well. We, it went so well that we told uh, Thanks to also um, update our Linux kernel to Linux 4.19, another LTS version, and then also to upstream stuff so we can reduce our burden in the future. And the upcoming dates were the manufacturing start so we have, like, beginning of the year 2019, so we are ready for the gardening season 2019. Then this, from our perspective, was quite uh, challenging time-wise. And when, for example, one thing was to get all the certifications, and this one especially is the one for the Wi-Fi Alliance, which you need to, in order to get the HomeKit um, approval from Apple. This is a prerequisite. A requirement for that, and that this yeah, this time it really helped us to be close to mainline. Uh, in this case, for the MediaTek uh, Wi-Fi driver, the MT76, we or I sent a gateway like late November to Spain for certification for Wi-Fi Alliance certification, and then one morning I was really happy that I got it out. One morning, I, the, I got the first results, like five out of 42 tests have passed. The rest is not going like, so well. A day later, it was around 12, and they fiddled around a bit. But yeah, it's quite far away from 42. And we really had to get this in time before end of year in order to get all the, yeah, the chips from Apple and so on and continue with the production. So yeah. Then we basically just called up the mainliner, uh, the, sorry, the maintainer of the MT76 driver on the phone. We agreed that uh, he should try, should help us, and we will sort out the details later. And this was on a Friday, and Monday he was already working, already had some fixes pushed. And yeah, 45 man hours later, the driver was in the state, which passed the Wi-Fi line certification. 
Another example of how it helped us greatly to be close to mainline was the problem we had when we first started to produce some more gateways, 250s to be exact. 30 out of them uh, did not work at all, failed our testing. Turned out the uh, Spinance had some bad blocks, which is to be expected, but what we did not know was that for whatever reasons, I didn't dig into it, the physical, the erase blocks, once it detected the bad one, it got moved to another one, and for some reasons, it got moved back to the first again, and this basically ate up the whole CPU time. Luckily, it was, based, it was fixed in like a half a day, which just upgraded to the already prepared 4.19 kernel, but I'm sure this, both of those not being close to mainline would, yeah, would have been a huge problem for our project and our timeline. Nowadays, the current state is that the pro project went well so far. It's, it's being sold now. We know, we don't know about any bad problems or the like. We have the empty, uh, the media tech support is upstreamed in Linux and U-Boot. Um, 5.4 has pretty much everything in it. 5.5, I think it's just like two or three patches left, which we on purpose do not try to mainline. And the same goes for MT76, everything is uh, mainlined. And it, I know of two other companies who passed the Wi-Fi line certification after us, and it, from one I know it was really easy for them to do it, it just worked out of the box. And for us, it means that we will uh, port this new, this new architecture we have back to the old gateway, and we will, again, upstream as much as possible. But I have to say there is, the situation is much better. It, uh, it was a different chip which has great upstream support. So for us, the conclusion is that this money was basically paid an external company to the mainlining stuff, it was spent really well, cost way less than 10% of the project budget, and it saved us at least twice. And I'm quite sure we would have had big problems yeah, not doing that. And we are also hoping that in the future it will help us greatly because we are just like two, develop, two developers. We, are, we will move on to new projects and maintaining this should be much simpler when we can just upgrade to new kernel version easily. And what we also what we had to learn or what we learned is that first we try to do our own uh, BSP for the, for the media tech, basically by taking over patches from OpenWRT. And we had to learn that, yeah, the real experts out there they are much quicker and much better at doing that work. Yeah, so uh, thank you for your attention. We have, I think, some time for questions.